Eight minutes of play following scenes of violent behaviour from a section of the English fans. They began ripping up seats and hurling missiles onto supporters below and onto the pitch. It was a dangerous situation. There were many young children at the match. The referee had no alternative but to take the players off and as police tried to evacuate the English contingent from the stand, the riot intensified with fighting breaking out elsewhere. Bad feeling had been apparent from the start with some rival supporters abusing the national anthems. trouble began shortly after David Kelly had scored for Ireland to give them the lead. Well we hear now from some of the people who witnessed the scenes at first hand starting with England coach Terry Venables. Well it's it's such a, um, a surprise really and such a bitter blow to what we're trying to do and trying to achieve and looking forward to 18 months time to the championships there's there's no words to describe it or what i feel about people like that um and it's an, it's an embarrassment to everybody but on top of that uh, a lot of people could have got hurt and uh, i just i have got no words to describe what i feel about it it's, it's a disaster this i hate this we've never had anything like this in this country Take we've never created time. anything like this aboard it's it's when i play for england i've never experienced anything like this before and I've seen a lot in football, but I've never seen anything like that. And then the game was abandoned within 15, 10, 15 minutes of getting off the park. They came and told us they'd abandoned the game. And I said, well, I didn't want the game abandoned. I would rather we went on with the game. I mean, what are you going to do with 2,000 English supporters running around Dublin tonight? Clearly, there are 30, 40, 50, maybe 100 people here tonight who've taken it upon themselves to come along to, to pull sticks out of the seats, to endanger the safety of people all around them and generally to spoil everybody's enjoyment and uh, to, to, to cast a blight over, over English football once again. And, uh, you know, it, it really seems to be never-ending. We can't drive these hardcore people out of the game. And it's, it's very distressing for everybody who, 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 who works for football and works in football. It's distressing for the players, obviously, and for the supporters, the genuine supporters, and for everybody connected with the game. Were you happy with the ticketing arrangements? No, I've no adverse uh, comment to make about the ticketing arrangements. I mean, if, the, if there's anything we wish to say about that, we will say so, but I've no, no comment about it at the moment, I'm afraid, Ray. I know it's a very initial reaction, but with the European Championships next year, what do you fear UEFA's view might be of this? Well, I don't think they'll be awfully happy, obviously, but uh, we, we will have to satisfy them that we have the situation under control in our own country and in our own grounds. Hopefully we will be able to do that, but uh, obviously we will have to assess what happened here uh, carefully and calmly in the cold light of day. During your preparations, were you aware that there might be a pocket full of troublemakers here tonight? Yeah, I think we're always aware of that. We work very carefully with, uh, with, with us directly with the English FA and our police forces have worked directly with the police forces over there. We are fairly happy that things are going to work out for us. There's always a possibility something will happen and unfortunately we have a few bad eggs out there who cause problems. We're not going to be on the back pages for football tomorrow. We're not going to be, you're not asking me questions about football and that's wrong because that's what we've come here to Dublin to do, um, to prepare for the European Championships. Who knows what repercussions um, are going to happen now. What can we say? We're, we're, we're professional footballers and I want to see football played on a rectangular pitch and, and, and not outside it. And unfortunately, we keep having to fall back into answering questions about what's happening off it. Uh, I mean, uh, the behav behaviour of uh, both uh, sets of players uh, were immaculate. The referee acted very quickly and got them off fast, so there was no danger there. But it's the people in the crowd and, and, and what they look at. I mean, y you do think it's organised. I can't really say too much because I don't know to the extent of what's happened and I would be shooting in the dark a little bit. But um, I don't know what it's done to us. I'm not, I, I mean, I'm really, really upset about it. You must be very frustrated too. Here we are building towards Euro 96. It's not even that. I can't even think about the football at the moment. I mean, it's just so sickening. We are now going to be involved in a, in a long, hard tussle about whose fault it was and where and what repercussions are of it. And, and there will be many. I mean, that's why you're all stood here like this, wanting stories. You've got loads of stories. You'll love it for the next fortnight. 
Are you there involved? Other implications for a Euro 96? I've no idea. Not as far as we're concerned. We play the North here. But I guarantee when the North come down, they will behave themselves. And we will behave ourselves. And there'll, be no, there'll, be, there'll be none of that with us. It never has been. And I think I, everyone's ashamed tonight. Ah, listen, no, listen Jack. every Englishman should be ashamed of what went on there tonight. Ray Stubbs putting the questions. Well, Jimmy Hill and Alan Hansen were with us tonight to enjoy a game of football. Now it's become an inquest into this wretched hooligan business again, Jimmy. Everybody mm. expressing disgust, and it was disgusting, but the solutions are a bit more difficult to come by. I haven't had any solutions yet. No, I, I think the first thing um, on which we probably agree is that it was premeditated and it was organised. I mean, that, those things don't happen by accident, and there was nothing there to inspire it if it hadn't been uh, premeditated. Uh, they, those people went there looking for trouble and looking to incite trouble. England going a goal down had nothing to do no, with it in your estimation. It, it, some, they depict some moment. It's a disease of our society and it's outside the influence of football, in my opinion, to stop that kind of behaviour. We should be ashamed of it. We, people of my age are certainly ashamed of it. Uh, but there's nothing we individually can do about it. Governments can do something about it and society can. It's no use keep casting the blame at football's door. We've heard that police intelligence knew there was going to be trouble at the match. Indeed, they had some security office in, officers in amongst the crowd there. They had riot police outside, and yet it still happened. Do you think the police was, were perhaps a little bit naive in their approach to it? or I, th There's never been a history of any, that kind of violence in Ireland. Quite. And although they were expecting something, I don't think they expected the avalanche that, that eventually happened you know, four and a half thousand people, they weren't all involved by any means, mm. but the, the mayhem that erupted made the whole scene impossible for, uh, you know, decent ordinary policemen to control. And it wasn't until the riot squad came in and actually handed out some quite severe medicine, you know, which, which will upset a lot of people. They say they shouldn't behave like that. Look at the way they were whacking them with their truncheons. Mm. But, I mean, either society makes up its yeah. mind that it's going to... Uh, you know, take the action that will bring an end to this kind of thing, or we stop worrying about it and just say, well, that's, that's what it's like living in this country or in any country at this time. I basically agree with that. I think that uh, the Republic is the last place you'd expect any sort of trouble. But Their record's wonderful, it's, isn't it? It's fantastic. It's both home and away. And I, yeah. You know, up till a week ago, I thought the dark days of the violence and the thuggery had gone, but obviously that's wrong. But football cannot admit defeat to this problem. I think it's better than it was 10 years ago, and if it means more cameras, more security, more police, more intelligence, and more resources, let's have them, because we cannot admit defeat. And I agree with Jim, I think it's, it's on a broader basis. I think this is a law and order problem. Yeah. And I think the courts should have wider powers to impose stiffer penalties, and let's stop feeling sympathy for the perpetrators of violence. Let's feel sympathy for the victims, and, and we've got to eradicate this problem. You see, closed-circuit cameras did a great job, really, in, in identifying those who are guilty. They're still there. I mean, or they're still there in our grounds, and they still should be used, and the, and the punishment should be handed out. That's one thing. I mean, I would like to see identity cards in this country. If you're talking about what should we do, um, it, you know, innocent people, why should we worry about carrying identity cards? Well, they do in most countries in Europe, yeah, don't they? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for everyone. I mean, I've no resentment of that at all, and it would help. But I also think passports should be withdrawn of known offenders. I mean, if these people are saying, oh, we knew there were known offenders going there tonight and people going to cause trouble, we're going to say, why don't we just take their passports away from them and say, you stay at home when the England team or any other team is playing abroad. I mean, either we make up our mind, that's society, that is, because I've said it's outside football's uh, remit and it really is. We make up our mind that we're going to eliminate that kind of behaviour from this country because it is a disease uh, and uh, unless we do that they will laugh in our faces as they continue to do standing there with Nazi salutes for those people who lost uh, loved ones in the war and think what do you think about no, that's that? horrifying. In, a perfect, it horrifying in a perfect world you'd stop them traveling and their face stop taking take the passports away. away but yeah. if you know there are troublemakers how are they allowed to travel how, do, how are they allowed to go they're allowed to, to travel they shouldn't be it's difficult to stop them isn't yeah. it yeah well, there's no I, law there's that, no, no law that allows that to happen at the present time. The one thing I do resent, really, about it is that everybody takes some of the blame except the people responsible in a way. You know, the Irish, were they a bit unawares? You know, how do we allow them to travel? Government should do this, football should do that. 
uh, in the end, everybody else is taking the share of the blame and we don't get at those people who are the root cause of the problem. And that's what we have to make up our minds to do. But you, can, you can still have security to prevent it. You know, if, if the, the intelligence sources knew that there was going to be 40 or 50 troublemakers there, then the communication should have been better. And the, the, the Irish yes, police should that. have been in there mm. and, and sorted it out. Yeah. Well, going back to football issues, there's a question mark now over the, over the um, European Championship next year being held here. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I think uh, for some time now, I mean, we haven't been able to play England-Scotland matches. I mean, that's sort of just left. It's a civilised country. We're living in a civilised country. We can't play Scotland at football. I mean, it's, it's unthinkable, really, but we've all it's accepted. Happened. We've all accepted that now. But when it comes to a major sporting event, I think the European authorities will realise that England, with its modern grounds, with the, well, the practice it's had at dealing with the hooligan element over here, will cope with it quite well. And I'm quite sure, in the end, it will go ahead, and there won't be any trouble. Never Thank any you. problems at Wembley, is there? You know, when England play at Wembley, never any hints of trouble. And I think that'll be in England's favour. Thank you for the moment. So we had to discuss it once again. Uh, the stadium was, um, w was emptied very quickly in a very orderly way and the Guardian then went about the business of cornering the people who were responsible in a most professional way and I must pay tribute to them. It was clear of course that riot police were on duty and the National Criminal Intelligence Service who monitors the activities of football hooligans have told us tonight that several weeks ago they warned that disorder was being planned and passed that information on to the Guardian. Well, that is possible. Uh, I'm not too sure of what happened in the whole area of security. Uh, but the history, uh, in the last time England played here, we had um, serious incidents also both around the ground and in our main thoroughfares after the match. So I, I suppose it was natural that we would expect some trouble, but the scale of violence tonight was indeed frightening. And it does raise major questions, as I said, about how people, certain people got tickets. But it does raise a question also about the safety of fans that would be going to the European Championships next year. Well, finally, I wanted to ask you very briefly about that. Do you think uh, England's ability to host that has to be called into question? Well, I think the English authorities are very responsible people, and I know that they will face up to this decision in a very responsible way. I, I would let that to them to decide. Berndale, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. tonight's events. Well, it's shocking. <coughs> it's something that is brings a disgrace on all of us, even even though even the very good supporters, because it's attached, it's, it's slur on our on our country, and, and it's really dreadful. And I think there are a number of questions that need to be asked. And I share very much the uh, views of the Minister for Sport from Ireland that there needs to be a very immediate look into how this could have happened, how many of these people who are known to be uh, thugs who have gone along to English matches before were able to travel. Well, Philip Conwell, just picking up on that, again, the National Criminal Intelligence Service says that 1,600 were travelling with the FA Travel Club, but 2,000 travelled without tickets. Now, 2,000 travelling without tickets, is it not possible to have actually halted or stemmed that tide over to Ireland? Well, we've just been hearing in other news bulletins about the possibility of lowering the border controls between various countries in the EC, and the problem of just putting them up, I mean, to cross from the nor Northern Ireland into the Republic of Ireland is very easy now. And so, <laughs> quite how they would actually manage to stop people, particularly those who don't have criminal convictions. One of the big problems in the past has been a tendency among overseas authorities to round up anybody who they suspect of being involved. And rather than trying to get convictions and evidence, they have simply deported people. And so most people who have been involved in these activities don't actually have a record, so you can't ban them. Well, John Williams in Leicester, you have made a study um, of organised hooliganism on football crowds and indeed presence of far-right cells. Now it seems tonight from the scenes that we saw that there were Nazi salutes, so there was a question of the National Front being involved and that they had planned to travel. How do you think they would have travelled? Well they would have travelled uh, through the, the many outlets which are available to get to Ireland. It's not a difficult place to, uh, to get but to. But would they have travelled as a group or do you think they would have had split up knowing that they were going to come together to cause trouble? I think they'd have gone individually and, uh, and in small groups too. I mean it's, it, it's, it's no surprise given the, the current political situation in Ireland and given what the NFIU and other police organisations know about the loyalist connections with some, uh, some football hooligans, there's the strong far right connection with England stretching back uh, a long way and, and to be fair what we have to say is that is that the real persistent problem over the last couple of years has been with the national team much less so with our club teams traveling abroad uh, those supporters have behaved really very well it, 
It is the national team which is a focus for this very aggressive, nationalistic, right-wing, and in this case, loyalist support. It must be said that tonight the National Front have denied, of course, that they had anything to do with this. Well, the National Front will deny they've had anything to do with this. Kit Hoy. Well, I just want to pick John up on one thing, because I attended the Republic of Ireland versus Northern Ireland match uh, a few months ago in Belfast, where you'd have thought there would have been a huge problem. It was policed extremely well, and there wasn't a problem. And I think it's, it's a danger if we try and divert this to being seen as some kind of Northern Ireland, Southern Ireland thing. This was actually about a few thugs who have gone out of their way to wreck football, and the authorities must take it seriously. But Nick Hawkins, tonight the Home Secretary calls it a disgrace, but it, it, this, is, this is the history. Italy, 1990, Sweden, 92, Rotterdam, 93. A failure to actually connect with this small group who are intent on causing trouble. Well, I agree that it is a small group, and I don't think they deserve the name of football supporters. I hope that they will be caught. I hope they'll be banned from ever attending matches in future. And I hope that there will be very serious sentences given to those mindless thugs who've ruined the uh, enjoyment of everybody else who wanted to enjoy the match. When you looked at those scenes tonight in television and, and some very violent, ugly scenes, a lot of blood, the Garde moving in swiftly, do you think having had the intelligence that this was going to happen enough was done by way of preparation? Well, I think we have to have an inquiry starting first thing tomorrow morning to see what the intelligence actually was. Clearly, from the fact that the trouble has been so bad, not enough was done, but I wonder whether that is actually a failure of intelligence, or as Philip Cornwall has said, the fact that you cannot get intelligence on those who haven't got previous criminal convictions. If people with otherwise previously a good record have decided to set out and be violent, there's not an awful lot that the authorities can do by way of pre-planning and pre-control. Kate Hoey, do you go along with that? There's not a lot to do? Uh, I think that a lot of money's been spent in setting up the Football Intelligence Unit and there has been a lot of legislation passed. I think there has been a growing complacency uh, because there had, the, the problem hasn't been seen to be so visible in the pan. I think it's very important with the European Championships now that tomorrow I'm interesting that the Irish Minister for Sport is going to talk to our Minister for Sport because it's very important that somebody takes the initiative and coordinates, sits around the table with the football authorities and with everybody who's got an interest in the game to actually see what needs to be done to ensure that the European Championships can go ahead because they must go ahead, otherwise it will be a victory for the thug. Philip Cornwall, in the fanzine world, how is the uh, Criminal Intelligence Unit regarded? They always predict that there will be trouble and to some extent they, they, they've always shown to be right. Uh, I saw the Home Secretary earlier saying we had a, a recently a relatively good record, but England's last major away game was the Holland game in Rotterdam in 93, mm -hmm. and there were, there were problems then. Uh, but one point I'd like to raise relates to closed circuit TV, because a lot of, has been made of its effect in this country. Uh, it, after the events in Rotterdam in 93, we called for the FA to actually pay for it to be installed, even on a temporary basis, at those grounds where England were playing abroad, because it is actually much easier to get away with something abroad in a ground where there is no closed circuit TV compared within this country and there was a question mark over, over the uh, TV within the ground early this evening. Well Nick Hawkins, picking up on that, the, the lack of closed circuit TV, do you think that should be almost mandatory for away games? Yes, I think after the trouble we've seen both in Rotterdam and tonight, I'm afraid it is going to be inevitable. Claiming that officials had identified known far-right National Front followers in the England crowd. At Westminster, the Home Secretary said extra measures would be taken against football hooligans if necessary. I think we've got to find out exactly what happened and what action we can take in future which will give us a better chance of avoiding dreadful, disgraceful scenes like those we've witnessed tonight. We have to accept that there is a real problem with English supporters and, and some English supporters who attach themselves to the game. We've got to weed them out. We've got to make sure that if they're identified as being members... <laughs> But the repercussions for English football could be immense. Already there are questions on whether or not England should be allowed to hold next year's European Championships. And at worst, English football could be back in the wilderness. Reactions and the latest from Dublin coming up. First, Julian Waters describes the night's events. This was the spark that lit the hooligans' blue touch paper. The innocent act of Ireland taking the lead through David Kelly. But while Ireland celebrated the goal, for some English fans, it was the cue for violence. In the West Stand, seats started being ripped out. Dutch referee Dennis Yoll ordered the teams from the pitch for their own safety after 27 minutes. 
amid the worst scenes of violence associated with the national team since the European Championships of 1992, the players were never to reappear. As disorder reigned in one corner of the ground, most of the players trooped off the pitch. Some needed encouragement from the referee to clear the area, and some could only stand and stare. These are the pictures being beamed around the world, once more bringing shame on English football. Tempers ran high as a period of limbo developed, with police trying to restore order to the stadium. One particularly long bench was lobbed from the upper tier onto other English fans standing below. The police ordered the referee to abandon the game with little prospect of law and order being re-established. Some could hardly believe their young eyes. As Lansdowne Road gradually emptied out, only the English fans remained. The police had the task of controlling the mob and making arrests. Serious violence developed. And as usual, it was only a small minority of football followers involved, but a dreadful wound has been inflicted on the whole of English football. Inevitably, bad injuries were sustained in the close combat situation. This was the first fixture on foreign soil for England coach Cherry Venables, and as he left Lansdowne Road, he must have been reflecting that it wouldn't be surprising if no other country wants to play host to our national team. Julian Waters, Sky Sports. The National Criminal Intelligence Service, which monitors the activities of English football hooligans, said it had been aware that some fans were planning to cause trouble in Dublin. It was estimated that more than 3,000 England fans were inside the ground at kickoff. Some gave Nazi salutes during the national anthems and chanted anti-IRA slogans. There were numerous arrests after the game, but it's thought that there were many more injuries as baton-wielding police tried to restore order. Our reporter, Mark Saggers, was in Dublin and witnessed the worst of the violence and gauged the Irish reaction. They were disgusted because they've never had trouble like this at any sort of, uh, not only any sort of football match, but any sort of sporting occasion. Lansdowne Road has never seen anything like this. And there were one or two criticisms last night of the Guardi. Were they well enough prepared? Did they act swiftly enough to the situation? Did they realize that this sort of situation could have happened? They'd obviously been uh, in contact with undercover agents from England and working very closely with the FA about uh, previous problems that uh, England fans abroad have caused. But uh, they handled the situation probably in the best way they could. And you have to say that the Irish people last night, when asked to leave Lansdowne Road very disappointed, did so without any trouble whatsoever. Mark, what do you think is going to happen next? Any more indications about a threat to Euro 96 next summer? The first thing that's going to happen, David, is that the FA will be sitting down this morning and planning an inquiry. They were very reticent last night to say anything about ticket sales, anything about how this could affect Euro 96. They are deeply worried about that. Graham Kelly was as shocked as I've seen him last night. And uh, they'll be sitting down this morning and deciding who is going to be involved with this inquiry. They'll work very closely indeed with the Football Association of Ireland. And of course, they will have to work very closely indeed with UEFA. And just one other thing to bear in mind, there are British clubs still involved with Chelsea and Arsenal coming up in Europe very shortly. There's a trip to Bruges as well. And that is now going to be a very worrying side effect to the problems that we saw in Dublin last night. And after the match, these were the reactions to the night's events at Lansdowne Road. I really don't want to talk about it because I'm so mixed up and I'm so sick of the whole business. It was a, it was a smashing game. And it's about football, isn't it? Not about... Well, I think we were hoping that... The whole problem. nation is going to suffer because of two, 2,000 or whatever lunatics were mixed in among 2,000 supporters. It's, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy.
my reaction is the same as everybody else. We're a, a, appalled. I mean, it is a terrible... I mean, I haven't got words strong enough to describe how we all feel about this. When the missiles were being thrown down onto the pitch, did any of the players get hurt at all? No. Uh, the referee acted, looked to be reacting very quickly, uh, called the players off, and uh, no one suffered any injury. Were you satisfied that the game should have been abandoned when it was? I, listen, I mean, I wouldn't quite criticise anybody on a decision because the police have had to make a decision and it's a, a, a decision of Solomon, so to speak, to know what the right thing to do. Everyone will be talking about that. Whatever they feel is right at that particular moment, you've got to go along with. They're obviously concerned with the safety of the people. You know there's repercussions maybe in some directions, but whichever... Uh, decision would have been made it a lot of people would have made it wrong so they can't be so whatever's been decided we've got to go along with is this an isolated incident or do you think we are returning to the bad old days when uh, we had uh, football hooliganism well i think it takes you um, a very very long time to get out of a of a, a bad thing really and i think you know five ten years ago we was renowned throughout europe for the sort of things that we've seen tonight i think what happens in in any walk of life, in anything that's good, it takes you a long, long time to get those good things going. And it has done, and we seem to be stepping in the di right direction. Only two weeks ago, things happened in Italy, and the English were held up as an example to, to them of how to curb what we've seen tonight. But in one incident tonight, we've gone right back down to where we was before. And, and it, make no mistakes, this isn't just in England and Ireland. This will go reverberate right through the world about us again. And like I said, we, we spent so much hard work and time trying to, to stop it and we're back down there again and, and it may be how long is it going to take now to get back to where we was the only thing i can do is criticize the people who come here to to cause trouble and they they come they cause trouble there's 46,000 people in here tonight and the, our enjoyment has been spoiled and uh, you know I, i'm just very shocked by the callous disregard they have for the safety of children and and, and other people around them i mean it's it's, it's quite amazing really and uh, I, I, I really can't understand it. Long term, what do you think the implications are for the European Championships next year? I, I really can't answer that, Nick. You know, we're, we're talking in the middle of a very difficult situation. Uh, that question has got to be uh, asked and it's got to be answered, but I really, I really can't answer it at this moment. Um, I, I don't think that it necessarily has implications for it, but I understand you asking it and uh, it, it's a situation we will have to face mindless vandalism and everything else and it certainly it, it, it ruins the good security record which we have here mm. I, I was in the crowd a lot of the people afterwards were blaming the fai now maybe wrongly so they said that you know they shouldn't have allowed these fans to come here and to put them up there possibly not it's something we're going to review we, we, we bring fans from all over the world to our games we bring the standard number of supporters that we send to fans normally we work with the fa uh, who issued these tickets to their travel clubs. They did everything, at least as far as we were concerned, to try and ensure that the right kind of fans came. Obviously, the, the right kind didn't come, and it's a worry for us. In recent years, the English football authorities believe that they had uh, the problem of football hooliganism under control. But last night's scenes in Dublin follow three recent incidents in England, the Cantona incidents and separate crowd disturbances at Blackburn and Chelsea. Well, all these latest events would seem to signal a return to what was once described as the English disease, with football hooligans causing havoc across Europe. And these are just some of the sorry statistics of a problem that's bedeviled the English game in the past. The 70s saw Tottenham and Leeds fans riot in Europe. The problem continued into the 80s, culminating in the Heysel Stadium disaster in 1985. That saw English clubs indefinitely banned from Europe. In 1988, so-called England fans rioted at the European Championships in Stuttgart and there was further havoc at the 1992 European Championships in Sweden. Well, now the events in Dublin could have far-reaching repercussions with the European Championships due to be staged in England next year thrown into jeopardy. It was a season that began so full of optimism. As host of Euro 96, English football had finally been recognised for the giant strides made away from the dark days of the 70s and 80s, when football hooliganism had become known simply as the English disease. But only weeks after the October ticket launch of the European Championships, the image of the game had once again been irrevocably tarnished. Eric Cantona's malevolent attack on a spectator at Crystal Palace brought disgrace not just on the Manchester United star, but the game in general. Whilst the incident reversed the traditional trend of football violence, the Frenchman's actions and what followed carried more ominous implications for crowd safety. 
Just days later, the English game was further damaged by an attack on referee Roger Gifford following Blackburn's draw with Leeds. The Ewood Park Club escaped an FA reprimand by promptly confiscating the fans' season ticket. But the football authorities warned clubs to avoid a repeat of this situation by taking necessary precautions. But the crowd disturbances that marred Chelsea's FA Cup exit at the hands of Millwall last week highlighted the problems that still remain. It led to urgent calls for a return to fencing just six years after perimeter barriers had led so tragically to the 95 deaths at Hillsborough. Given the improvements in crowd control and stadia facilities, it was hoped the cure for the cancer of football violence had at last been found. But in a season that's been blighted by scandal and disgrace off the pitch, events at Chelsea and Lansdowne Road have tarnished the English game still further. Southall, Sky Sports. There have already been calls for the FA to withdraw as hosts of next year's European Championships. Well, two former England captains watched events unfold here on Sky Sports with Richard Keyes. And Alan Ball and Jerry Francis both shared the same view, that Euro 96 should not be cancelled. You're not condoning anything, but uh, there are millions of really good football supporters in this country um, who I don't think should be deprived of seeing a spectacle uh, because of... Uh, you know, a few absolute mindless idiots, really. And, um, you know, we've had situations in Italy recently where somebody's been killed and they banned football for the weekend, the following weekend. So there is an element throughout the world. It's just I feel that we've got to work that much harder, whichever way we can, to isolate them and ban them from the game altogether. Mm. And if there is any way that your cameras or anybody's cameras can help isolate the ones that are throwing things over the top there, I think they should be banned for football for life. What are your thoughts about the European Championships coming mm. here in 1996? Well, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with, with Jerry. It, it's, um, I've, I've been involved with Jerry in these type of tournaments and they are fantastic things for people to look forward to, uh, for England to host them. Um, they are marvellous things for the country and for people in sport and especially football, which is the national game here, to look forward to and for us to pit our our, our best players against the best players in Europe, you know, for it to be even thought of as being stopped for a mindless few. Mm. Uh, Do you think know, it was the right even, decision to stop it? The game, mm. of course, where safety for children's sakes and, and, and let, thank God there no, doesn't look to be any real serious injuries. Well, after the break, the rest of the news on a night that uh, threw English football into disgrace. The game between the Republic of Ireland and England in Dublin last night, abandoned because of crowd violence. Stay with us. In the fourth round of the FA Cup,